Welcome everyone to the Council of Deans of Health webinar on the National Preceptorship Framework for Nurses in England. Thank you very much for joining. Um, my name is Megan Isherwood and I'm a policy officer at the Council and I'll be facilitating the discussion later on in the session. So I'm honoured today to be joined by Dr Jane Ray, a Senior Clinical Nurse Advisor, and also Desiree Cox, Programme Lead for the National Preceptorship Programme for Nursing in England. They are here today to raise awareness of the framework and standards and how it applies to us within the education sector. So I'm now going to hand over to Jane and Desiree, who will give her a short presentation, and then there'll be time at the end for a Q&A, so please do submit those questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Jane. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm going to share my screen with you, um, and we'll go through the, the perceptorship framework, some information about the quality mark, and then some advice and guidance for those working in the in the sector. I'm Jane Ray and I'm the Senior Cl Clinical Nurse Advisor for the National Perceptorship Programme. I'm also a Senior Lecturer in Nursing at Hull University. Um, so I'll be talking from that perspective uh, as well. But first I'd like to hand over to Desiree who's gonna go through some of the information around the background and context. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Desiree Cox. I'm the National Perceptorship Programme Lead for Nursing, and I've also been the Capital Nurse Perceptorship Programme Lead for the London Programme for the last six years, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. And the rest of the time, I deliver management training for all NHS staff in London. So I'm going to take you through who our team are, and I'm going to then talk to you about the framework and the quality mark. Could I have the next slide, please, Jane? So we have a great team. Well, I think we're a great team anyway. Um, you've met Jane, you've met me. We also have Anna, who is part-time project manager with us, who does a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff for us. And we have Jenny, who's our central point of contact for the interim quality mark, and who does far more than that. She does a lot for us, particularly in the administrative side. Our next slide, please. Around the country, we also have seven regional leads. Now, the role of a regional lead is to work with us as a national team and disseminate that information out through organisations within their region. And that is through setting up communities of practice. And it includes all organisations. So we're talking NHS, primary care, acute specialist, community, mental health, learning disabilities. And also social care, we're working very closely with social care organisations to bring them into the fold so we can ensure a consistent approach. Now, one thing that has struck me about working with our regional leads and about our other stakeholders is the passion that they have for new registrants and for perceptorship. So in the northwest, we've got Rachel Alty, and in the northeast, we've got Eileen Aylott. East of England, we've got Deborah Cubitt, and southeast, we've got Tanya Top. In the Midlands, we've got Jenny Hulse, who has worked with me on Capital Nurse in the past. And in the southwest, we've got Melvina Stober, and I am still the London lead. Now, we've put our contact details on there so that if any of you do want to contact us, please do so. We'd love to hear from you. Next slide, please. So over the next few slides, I'm going to talk to you about the background of the National Preceptorship Programme. Why a National Preceptorship Programme? I'm going to give you an overview of the framework, the resources that we have on offer for organisations, and our fairly new and very exciting quality mark. And Jane will then pick up from me and take you why, why does preceptorship matter? And who does it matter to? And she'll take you through the top tips for preparing your students for perceptorship. Next slide, please. Now, the next couple of slides are slides that we used recently when we had an event in London at a big event on celebrating perceptorship, which was attended by well over 200 people in a face to face and by around oh, close on 400 people virtually. And we so like these quotes that we have included them throughout our presentation. Now, Jane Clegg is a Regional Chief Nurse for London and our Senior Responsible Officer for the programme. And she said that an excellent perceptorship programme is critical 
in supporting newly registered nurses and nursing associates in the first few months of practice. Next slide, please. Now, Jane, whom you can see in your top right hand corner, talks about the value of perceptorship. And if we're committed to retaining our nursing workforce, we must look at ways investing to support them to stay. And what we hope with the perceptorship model and framework is that organisations will have the resources and the guidance to be able to deliver high quality perceptorship provision. Next slide, please. So why a national approach? Well, we know that many organisations have some form of perceptorship. In fact, we did a lot of research into different organisations and we found that perceptorship varied enormously from some very high quality and valued programmes to absolutely nothing. We know that our new registrants all need perceptorship, but the experience they were receiving was vastly different. Now, I mentioned earlier that I also work with Capital Nurse, and I was fortunate in that I joined Capital Nurse at the beginning of perceptorship in 2017. And in London, we had huge problems with retention of nursing staff, particularly in the first two years post-registration. And the biggest issue was in that first 12 months. So we put together our perceptorship framework, which we launched in January 2018. And we measured the progress. In fact, we still measure it on an annual basis six years on. And we look at the impact of perceptorship on our new registrants. Now I'm delighted to say that through Capital Nurse Perceptorship Programme, we increased retention in that first year from 72% to 92%. It might've gone down a little bit this year, but I'm going to go with this 92%, which was phenomenal. Then the NMC published their principles of perceptorship in 2020. Well, they didn't publish them, they refreshed them, which placed a greater emphasis on perceptorship. And organisations across England kept contacting me as the capital nurse lead and saying, could we have your quality mark, please? We offer a very good perceptorship programme. And they'd send me all this wonderful stuff and I'd look at it and say, I'd love to give it to you, but a capital nurse perceptorship quality mark isn't going to mean anything if you're in Leeds or Dorset or anywhere else in the country, because it's only recognised within the capital, i.e. London. However, we did become aware that there was an increasing appetite for a national framework and a national quality mark. And at Capital Nurse, we kept putting forward for some funding. And finally, in 2021, NHS England said that it would fund our project and we launched just before Christmas in December 2021, so that we could start looking at a national approach to perceptorship. Next slide, please. Now, we knew that if we took what we had in London and took it out to the regions, it wouldn't work. London's different. And we also know that people wanted something different in the region. They wanted their own programme. They didn't want what London had already delivered. So our targets were to design and deliver a national set of standards for all nurses in all settings across England. To develop the resources to support implementation in organisations, including standard documentation. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit long uh, detail later. And to develop an associated quality mark for organisations who meet certain criteria. And we had an incredibly tight time frame. We were given nine months to deliver this, which was certainly a challenge, but I'm delighted to say we did meet the challenge. I could have the next slide, please. So we started off with a literature review for Middlesex University. And we do have the link for that if you're interested in reading that. We had done a similar review when we started with Capital Nurse, but we wanted to make sure that our research was up to date. In addition, we did a survey of healthcare organisations around the country to find out what was happening with perceptorship in different organisations and to see what we could learn from that. We did a deep dive research into 26 organisations and that took the format of semi-structured interviews. 
we spoke to preceptorship leads in different organizations and they were typically ones that had a good preceptorship program in different parts of the country and in different settings because we wanted to know what worked what worked in social care what worked in acute community and in different geographical areas we then began to design and develop our framework and resources. And we engaged with many stakeholders, well over 500 stakeholders in the initial stages of our development. We wanted this to be a framework for the organizations and for nurses. We didn't want it to be a framework that we were imposing. We wanted people to be what they wanted. And in doing that, we put together a project delivery group who were made up of preceptorship leads from different organizations, different geographical regions and different settings to work with us so that we create something that would really be fitting for all sorts of organizations. And we rolled it out to organization for implementation in October 2022. Next slide, please. Now our stakeholder engagement, of which we're incredibly proud because we were quite overwhelmed. We would publish an event and it would be selling out within around two hours, even though there were sort of 150 tickets. So we were really pleased at the enthusiasm for creating this framework. So we engaged with different people around the country. We didn't just talk to the nursing organizations who would have our newly registered nurses, we talked to the Nursing Times. We talked to the Nursing Times quite extensively because they had done a survey which showed perceptorship needed improving. We talked to the Royal College of Nursing, the Care Quality Commission, the Florence Nightingale Foundation. We spoke to Spectrum Healthcare. We spoke to Social Care. We had articles published in Care Talk and the Nursing Times about our project and about perceptorship. We spoke to nurses in different settings, prison services, naval services, and we talked to nurses and students around the country on their experience of preceptorship. So we really engaged with a lot of people. Next slide, please. And from the engagement, we learned that preceptorship has to be valued and it has to be championed within organizations. And for that to happen, First of all, we have to have executive sponsorship. It's no good having someone who is passionate about perceptorship and who is sitting at a band six or band seven trying to lead perceptorship. It has to be endorsed and sponsored by our chief nurses and by our boards. We have to have buy-in from all staff. It's not just about the people who are the perceptors, but everyone who works with our new registrants. We need policies and practices to be standardized so that we can ensure people have a consistent approach. You can never guarantee 100% consistency because of the personality variations. However, you can have a consistent approach. And we needed to agree core standards for all nurses in all settings. So those were the learning points on which we based our further work our perceptorship framework. We also identified certain essential elements. We needed a central point of contact in each organization, and that was our perceptorship lead. Now, where we have large organizations, the teaching hospitals, we know that there is going to be a full time perceptorship lead, and in some, there's actually a team of perceptorship people. However, in smaller organizations, that's a much more challenging requirement. If you take the GP practices, for example, or your care homes, both areas take fewer new registrants and both are very challenged with staff currently, or probably always actually. So we were looking at preceptorship leads across an organizational, for example, in primary care, we look at a training hub or the integrated care systems but we needed someone who is going to be responsible for perceptorship and act as a central point of contact. We know that if we're asking our nurses to be perceptors, 
we needed to be able to develop them, give them the skills they needed to feel confident in doing the role of a preceptor and engage with them. We knew that to do that, they should have protected time. Now, this is probably one of the thorniest issues. And those who will have recently seen the article in Nursing Times will see a little bit about how we approached it. We have managed to get eight hours a year protected time for our preceptors, which means that it should no longer be about the preceptor trying to fit a meeting with a new registrant in at the end of a 12 and a half hour shift or before they start a night shift. They should have protected time for their meetings with their preceptees and to receive some development themselves. There needs to be a structured program of learning for the preceptee. Now, one thing we have not done through our framework deliberately is we have not mandated what that structured program of learning looks like. Each organisation is so different, you cannot mandate what that programme of learning should look like. We know that a preceptor needs to be allocated to a preceptee within the first couple of weeks. And if it's possible for them to be allocated before the preceptee joins, that's even better. We need to include peer support so that our preceptors feel supported as well. And we needed standard documentation to have some consistency. And that standard documentation has included probably one of the most challenging pieces of work, a standard policy. And I say it's challenging because writing a preceptorship policy that meets all the requirements of all the organisations is difficult. We have a standard policy. We have role definitions for the preceptor, for the preceptee, the preceptorship lead and the preceptorship champion. Now, the role definition for a preceptee is important because our new registrants and our students don't know what is expected of them as a preceptee. We needed to set it out for them. We have standard documentation, which includes meeting templates, charters, slot analyses, individual learning plans. A lot of things that people can take and adapt to their own needs in their own organisations. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now look at what our slide, please. We came up with a new definition of purpose of preceptorship. Now it wasn't that there weren't a lot out there; there were. But we were asked to come up with a new definition of preceptorship. And we came up with the purpose of preceptorship is to provide support, guidance and development for all newly registered practitioners to build confidence and develop full competence as they transition to autonomous professional. It isn't just about our student nurses who are coming fresh out of university. It is also about our international nurses who may be very qualified and very experienced in their own country, to come to our country, join the NHS, which is a very different organisation, as a newly registered practitioner. It's people who have come out of a different environment. So, for example, they may have worked in a social care home and come into an acute setting. It's for people who are returning to practice. And it's for some of our mature students who may have life experience. It's about enabling everybody to develop confidence and competence in their new setting and their new role. Next slide, please. So our framework. Our framework is for all newly registered nurses and nursing associates. And so to clarify, that means anyone who is new to the NMC register. The sectorship must be for a minimum of six months, although we do advise that it should be 12 months and our gold standard requires a 12 months perceptorship period. Six months is the minimum to help people to settle into their new environment. We recommend two weeks or 75 hours, depending on the setting, of supernumerary. 
that each preceptee should have a minimum of three meetings with their preceptor during their preceptorship period. Now that will typically be one meeting within their first two weeks, at which they'll be looking at getting to know their preceptor, setting up their learning plan, looking at how they can integrate into their setting, finding out about how their setting works. And then another one midway through to look on how they're doing. Have they got any questions? Have they got any areas of concern? Are they feeling supported? And then one at the end, so that they can be signed off from their preceptorship and begin to look at the next period of time, the 12 to 24 months, and where they might like to go. Now, three meetings is not a lot, and we would really prefer that to be much more regular, and a lot of our organisations are making it more regular. We asked for protected time. We got protected time for our preceptors and preceptees. A central point of contact in each organisation or in each integrated care system. And our core programme of learning, in addition to the clinical requirements, must include wellbeing initiatives, building resilience, reflection, clinical supervision, pastoral care and support, and where appropriate, restorative supervision. So those are the core elements. Now the resources to support our implementation, we have developed a business case for our senior managers. We know that people like Jane, myself, our regional leads, our perceptorship leads, they're passionate about perceptorship. We don't need convincing about the benefit. However, we do know our senior managers do, particularly if they sit in finance. So we put together a business case and it includes figures for London, just outside London and in the regions, look at the cost of recruiting a newly registered band five nurse and training them over the first year. And looking at what they lost where retention was low. Because one thing that finance managers look at is the bottom line. So this business case is designed to help organizations to put perceptorship firmly on the agenda. We have case studies. I think we've got around 30 case studies of different people, Jane's nodding, that's right, good, thank you, Jane. Of different people in different roles, different organizations and different regions, talking about perceptorship. Now that might be as a newly registered nurse coming to the end of their perceptorship, it could be a preceptor showing the value of being a preceptor and what they get out of it, or a preceptorship lead or regional lead. We have preceptor development resources. Now we have workshops to develop our preceptors. If I'm honest, everybody has the ability and the skills to be a preceptor, but they don't always have the confidence translating those skills into preceptorship where they may be brilliant with patients, they feel a little bit more self-conscious with their colleagues. So this is largely about developing their confidence. So we have a half day workshop for our preceptors and we have a refresher for those preceptors who have been a preceptor for many years. We're not going to say right now, you've got to go on this shiny new training. No, we're giving them a refresher on what does it mean? And we have coaching skills, because a lot of being a preceptor is facilitating the development of the other person and empowering them to take ownership of their own development. Now, we have run a number of masterclasses, and we've probably had around 400 people through masterclasses on those three areas. And we will be running additional masterclasses over the summer because we're including action learning now. We've got the standardized document, which I talked about earlier, and we have approaches to evaluations. So we are asking organizations to evaluate their programs on an annual basis and to identify areas for development and improvement. So we have provided some organizations with the tools to do that. Now, last May, June, we did a baseline assessment to find out where organisations were. We had a response from 256 organisations, 
So we have excellent engagements. 53% of those organisations are already compliant with the National Perceptorship Programme, and 94% had a current Perceptorship Programme. Others were reviewing their programmes, aligning to them to the national standard and preparing for the gold standards. Many were already using the resources that we had been providing. And we realised that what we had done was revitalised passion for perceptorship amongst our organisations and their leads. Now, the baseline assessment is something that we will be repeating in June. And we will be able to evaluate the progress we have made over the year. Now, alongside our framework, we have our interim quality mark. And the interim quality mark was launched in December and opened in January for organisations who are providing an excellent programme and meeting the required standards. We have 10 mandatory criteria and they must meet these in order to be able to qualify. They must have a current policy. Perceptorship must be available to all new registrants and a minimum length of 12 months. There must be regular meetings between the preceptor and preceptee, and they must be able to evidence that they are offering protected time for the preceptor and the preceptee. They must have a preceptorship lead in place, a preceptor development program, and a formal structured program of learning for the preceptees. And they must be annually evaluating that. Now, in addition to that, we have seven supplementary criteria of which they are expected to achieve 80%. Perceptors of equal level or senior to the preceptee, supernumerary requirements, support network for preceptors, allocation to the new registrant within two weeks of their start date, perceptorship champions as volunteers to, to uh, promote perceptorship, a senior responsible officer typically on the board within an organisation, and additional development for perceptees. Now, to date, we have had 27 organisations apply for the quality mark. So far, 13 have received the quality mark. That might go up by the end of the day because we have a board this afternoon. So we are very proud that we already have a number of organisations who are meeting the requirements and who are able to offer a gold standard. Now, I'm going to hand over to Jane and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about why perceptorship matters to students, to new registrants, to uh, people working across the academic community and the practice community in, in terms of supporting both students and new registrants. What we know from the work that we've done to date is that perceptorship is critical in supporting those new registrants. We know from the new registrant perspective, they see the importance of being supported, they feel valued, and they also feel like they belong as part of that community in which they've started working. We know that it's, it's vital for, that, for them to have the best possible start to their career in nursing. Uh, as we've already mentioned, we know it's also important to organisations because we can demonstrate the, the business case for investing in, for example, perceptorship leads to support the retention of those new registrants. We know that it improves satisfaction, morale and engagement. And importantly, that framework of support is really part of the necessity of having a safety critical profession within the organization and making sure that that supports in place. But one of the things I often do with our student groups within my own role at Hull University, but and of course, when we're out talking about perceptorship, is I start, start by talking to them about what is the most important thing to them when they're choosing that first destination role. Because we know organisations, HEIs across the sector, provide that advice and guidance around career choice differently. And there's, there's some really great examples of really supportive, encouraging, coaching conversation and development within organisations. But we know it's variable across the sector. 
But when I talk to students and I ask them about these choices, they come up with a number of different things. Um, and some of them are absolutely about their clinical interests. That first choice of role is about the area they're most passionate in, they want to engage with, they want to have a future career in there. So that might actually direct them. For some, the location matters. So they may want to choose um, an organisation who, who's uh, close to them, or they might be want to relocate to a different area of the country. And it will actually depend a lot on their individual circumstances. For example, uh, whether they drive, whether they cycle, whether they walk or whether they're using public transport. So the choice may also be affected by that. We know one of the big things that comes out in terms of discussions, and certainly when we're talking to new registrants who are coming to the end of the preceptorship period, and we ask them, what did they wish they'd known? Or what did they wish they'd asked about? And that those opportunities for progression and career development are really important to both students and new registrants. Although they're choosing that first destination role, they're also thinking about what happens after 12 months, what happens in three years, what happens in five years. We also know that uh, some of the discussions are, I just want to stop moving around from placement to placement. I just want to be in one place for the same time for a few years while I, I get settled into my professional role. One of the biggest factors that influences that decision is the team they will be working with. And where students have had a really positive experience on placement, they're much more likely to choose that area as their first destination experience because they know the team, they know they're being supported as a student and they're confident that they'll be supported as a new registrant. So that will also influence their decision. For some, it's the shift patterns, working hours. For some, it might be the pay. But when you ask your students what matters to them, it's often a combination of these different things. So those conversations that happen with either the personal supervisor, academic tutor, while they're still in the HEI setting, these are the conversations that are important to have with your students. So what are students' expectations of support during that first year of professional practice? As we, as we mentioned earlier, the, we developed a role descriptor for preceptees. And that was a really important thing that both students and new registrants identified is having some clear expectations about what their role would be as a, as a new registrant and during that preceptorship period. The things that they have come back to in terms of what, what they like in terms of that HEI prepare, uh, preparation is it's really important for them that they feel prepared as well as consider them that doing the things that are preparing for that transition. We know that all HEIs prepare their students for that transition and for that professional role. And some of the things that is important when you're having those discussions with students is, is taking that opportunity once they've chosen that first destination role to think about what they can start learning while they're on their final placement, because that may or may, or may not be with the organisation that they're going to work with. So what the, can they learn? What knowledge can they gain? Who can they talk to? And I always recommend if they're considering a particular career pathway, whether that's in a particular clinical area or whether that's a future they're looking forward to in terms of going into leadership or an advanced nurse practitioner role or education or becoming a lecturer or going into research or any of those domains to actually start having those conversations while they're still a student, both with their tutors and their, and their peers and uh, those supporting them in practice. And through that reflection, thinking about what matters to them and what sort of choices they're going to make. Connecting and building personal and professional networks is an also an important part of that preparation for the transition to the preceptorship year. 
students when they're in universities often have really uh, extensive networks, they're in big peer groups, they have support both in the academic setting and they have support in the in the practice setting. And as they move from during through that transition, what Health Education England, I think referred to as the flaky bridge previously, is those networks can narrow quite considerably, particularly if they're going into an organisation where there's few new registrants, so they won't have that peer group in place. So one of the things we talk to students about is how to start making those clinical connections and networks, not only across their peers and the new registrants they might also be working with when they start that first role, but actually looking those areas of, of clinical interest. You know, if they're a member, for example, of the RCN or Unison, you know, what professional networks are available to them through, through those means, but also to look at other platforms such as social media. You know, there's the RCN newly registered nurses forum. There's lots of different groups around that support for students and new registrants during that transition. There are th some great things in development, like the Shiny Minds app that have been used to support well-being. So again, take those opportunities, start building and creating those networks that will support you when you get into that first year. And finally, um, to start thinking about and planning for the things that they can do. And this comes back to those earlier discussions about what matters to me, because some of that planning is about knowledge. Some of that planning is about networks. For some, it's very personal. It's around learning to drive, buying a car and things like that. Some of the practical things that they need to do in terms of preparing for that, for that first role. When we're talking to practice colleagues um, who are delivering preceptorship in organisation, we talk to them both about the students they're supporting in that final year, as well as the new registrants. And we, we also discuss the importance of that positive experience for students in terms of the influence in that choice in, as a first destination job. But certainly that ensuring that your students as well as on your registrants is, is, import, is important because they are your future students to, uh, in terms of our, for the university. They might be moving on into their first destination role, but two or three years down the line, they'll be wanting to come back and do further education. Not all of them, but certainly some of them. Those students are also our future colleagues. And I certainly see uh, in my own experience, students that I supervised 10, 12, 15 years ago, who are now looking at careers in education. So some advice and guidance for those of you working with uh, students in that, particularly in that final year is they will come to you for help, support and advice and, and guidance, as well as come and ask for references. So our, our advice today has really been, please do direct them to the help and information that's available around preceptorship. It's a really important question that uh, students need to ask when they're going for interviews and when they're um, asking about jobs and roles is, is to ask the questions around what that preceptorship framework of support looks like for them within that individual organization. Again, encourage students to be those lifelong learners and reflect prior to the transition so they understand um, what they have learned to date and what continuing support they might need as they go through that first year. And we talk to students about, you know, what, what they need to do, what are those really essential things to get in place, but also to think about what they want to do beyond the preceptorship year to the second, third and fifth years. And ask them to sort of make a plan which builds on those knowledge, skills, proficiencies and establishing those networks of support. Finally, we I do, when I'm speaking to students, do tell them particularly to be proud of their achievements, that 
the as they come to the end of their education program they have been on an amazing journey and for many the last few years have been has been a huge challenge in terms of their experience of students but they are joining a, a profession that has so many diverse and exciting career paths and as more students have experiences on placement in non-NHS in, uh, NHS settings, like in, in social care, in the voluntary independent sectors, more students will be looking at career paths that are um, al along those uh, ways. But we know where, while they all start at the same starting point when they finish uh, their programme of education, what that path will look like in the future will be different from everyone. So again, just encourage them to be a reflective practitioner, not just uh, during their programme, but as they go through that transition, so they can seek those opportunities to enhance and develop their knowledge and skills. But importantly, the, the, the need to reach out to others if they need help and guidance. It's a really common experience for new registrants to feel out of their depth and feel anxious and worried during that initial uh, transition period, uh, often referred to as the period of transition shock. So it's really important that they reach out to their peers, to the people that they're working with. But in some cases, they may reach out back to um, the, the university and their academic tutor or supervisor. And again, you know, encourage them to seek the advice and guidance that they need to move forward with their careers. So finally, the, when students are making those first choices, they will they will speak to everybody and anybody about what their what their first choice is and why they're choosing it. And so they'll speak to their peers, their family, their friends, people in academic settings their colleagues in practice to actually help them make that decision. And I think we've moved from uh, a period in uh, nursing workforce history where the number of new registrants um, are still um, areas of concern about how we retain them. And we do know that a preceptorship framework helps, but we also know because of the job vacancies, there is an awful lot of jobs out there for new registrants and in areas where they previously wouldn't be given the opportunity to work. So seek out those, those different opportunities in terms of those first job de uh, destinations. Please provide them with the information and resources they need. It's important that they feel in control of their own future, but we give them the tools to successfully navigate that journey. Just a reminder what the purpose of preceptorship is. And I believe that this preparation starts almost from the point where they start their programme. We are preparing the future leaders of, uh, of the nursing profession. And that preparation runs throughout the programme. But we know as they move into that final year and that choice of that first role, that the information and resources that are around preceptorship becomes more important to them. So again, just finally, I remind all our students that the first destination role is the, is the beginning of a long and diverse career in nursing. And so that first destination role will not be their last destination role, which is we want to encourage people to stay in nursing and be part of our profession. As we mentioned earlier, the evidence we've already gathered around the business case and around the retention data that Capital Nurse has captured has shown that if we can keep them in that first 12 to 24 months, we can often keep them for longer. So that's a really important part in terms of that retention journey. Again, just finally to ask students what matters to them in terms of those first uh, destination choices and talk about how you can help them prepare for that that transition shock or that flaky bridge, because it certainly doesn't need to be like that and we can support them better through that transition process. I provided our contact details uh, on this slide, included the link to the website. 
Um, and just finally, a big thank you, um, not only to our community, our seven regional communities of practice have been super helpful in terms of this piece of work. We've given you the contact to do reach out to them. What we know is that um, different uh, higher education institutions are engaged in those preceptorship community practice in different regions. So do reach out to them. We've had a really super steering group and a project delivery group. Um, but most of all, I would say it is the preceptorship communities of practice who've given us the information, advice and guidance to be able to do this piece of work. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Desiree and Jane, for such an informative presentation. It's a really amazing piece of work. I'm, I'm very impressed that you managed to deliver it in just nine months. Um, such a robust methodology. So that's amazing. Um, and yeah, it's clearly a very invaluable resource um, for health organisations to support those newly registered practitioners. But also it's useful to see why it matters so much for our members, the educators, and how they can best prepare and manage students' expectations and ensure that they can make the most out of those preceptorship programmes. So thank you. I am just going to turn over to the questions now. We've got about 10 minutes for some questions. Um, so we've got an anonymous question first. Um, I'm training on a dual field course, but it feels like preceptorships and trusts haven't caught up with this. I'm struggling to find a preceptorship that supports maintenance and training in both areas. It's looking like I might have to consider juggling two different jobs, which is obviously not ideal. Do you have any recommendations as to how to navigate this or are you aware of any good programs or trusts to support dual field nurses? Okay well this is a challenging one um, and what I would recommend to whoever this attendee is is that you find a preceptor who has also done a dual field course because that is going to be your best thing. The other thing you could consider is that some organizations are now operating what they call team preceptorship which means that each preceptee will have more than one preceptor and they could actually be different areas and that would be a way of ensuring that you have a good preceptorship experience so in terms of preceptorship those would be my recommendations Jane I don't know if you have anything to add no, I think that's really, really good advice. And I would certainly speak to the uh, employing organisation you're considering to have that conversation because they may have well have people who can support that. And I, we know in other settings, having that team support or two different people who are fulfilling that function also works. Thank you. That's really helpful. Then we have a question from Michael Bartholomew. Um, are you aware, aware of preceptorship programmes for other healthcare professions, such as allied health professions? I asked because once qualified, I will be an operating department practitioner, an ODP, I'll, and will be registered with HPC, not an MC. And if I can just tag on another question, I'm just, I know that a lot of of our members are from outside of England in the devolved nations. So I don't know if you could speak to other equivalent frameworks in the devolved nations as well. Okay, shall I answer the first bit and then Jane will do the second bit. Okay, yes, we are aware of other preceptorship programmes. The midwifery framework has recently been launched probably about two weeks ago. The allied health professional um, framework is currently in development. They recently agreed their principles of preceptorship with the HCPC. And hopefully they will be launching later this year. What we do know about these frameworks is they are aligned with the nursing frameworks. And the only reason we didn't have a multi-professional one is we did not want to dilute preceptorship for all the different professions. And as I'm sure you appreciate allied health professions, there are 14 professions within there. So it's challenging. The likelihood as an ODP is that you will be included in the nursing preceptorship anyway until the AHP preceptorship framework is up and running. We do however also know that a lot of organisations are already providing multi-professional preceptorship frameworks and the AHPs are very closely aligned with our work. We're working with them both Jane and I. So hopefully Michael that will answer your question and Megan's other part, Jane over to you. Okay, yeah. So um, in terms of the four nations, there is 
I think, it, again, a similar level of work uh, across the sector. So the nursing midwifery framework has been written for England, but the AHP one, I understand, is going to be looking at four nations. However, we have been working with the Nursing Midwifery uh, Council and with our colleagues in both uh, in the other nations so that all our framework documents are kind of sister documents and marry up really. There is some differences because of uh, the, the standing of those organisations, but uh, we've all been working uh, together throughout really just to try and keep them looking broadly the same and, and addressing the same issues. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I'm now gonna to go to Daniel Johnson's question because I think it's very relevant for our members. So uh, Daniel is a student mental health nurse at the University of Northampton and he asks, is there a way for students to engage with the preceptorship program while studying? Jane? I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, that's a really great question. Um, um, well, I think, first of all, I'd like to say I'm well aware that in some organisations, they offer some preparation around that sort of, you know, step up to work approach. Um, so it may be worth asking about that within the, within the organisation that you're you're working um, but if you're interested in preceptorship, then I would just go and ask who the preceptorship lead is and say, you know, can, can I find out more? Can you give me more information? Or within the area in which you're a student, you should be able to ask. Uh, there will be people who are both practice assessors, practice supervisors. Also, they will be um preceptors, as well as uh, clinical nurse educators. So they probably undertake multiple roles. So do reach out to colleagues that you're working with and, and ask those questions. I would also recommend that you have a look at our website because we've got lots of information on preceptorship and the earlier you learn about it, the better prepared you will be when you join the nursing workforce. So do have a look. Brilliant. Um, I'm now just going to go to another anonymous question. We've got five more minutes. So um, I've heard that the NMC are considering shortening the next nursing programmes to incorporate perceptorship programmes. Do you have any thoughts on this? I haven't heard of it, had you, Jane? I would be very surprised if they considered shortening the length of nursing programmes, particularly given the extra competencies which have been put into the nursing programme. And I think, I mean, certainly I haven't heard it in terms of short mm. programmes. If we look at international models uh, around that framework of, of, they don't always call it preceptorship, but some programmes are four years, for example. So that final year is what we would call the preceptorship year, or they might have an internment uh, internship for a year. So there is, but I, I think shortening the programme, I, I can't see how that would be actually possible. Thank you. And then we'll squeeze in one final question. So thinking about capacity, how can we ensure there is sufficient preceptive capacity to support newly qualified registrants? And I think this is something we hear a lot from our members in terms of concerns with placements and capacity for practitioners to support our students in and supervise them in, in placement. So how can we ensure this is happening on the preceptorship programme? Okay, this is an easy one to answer. Partly because we do recommend one preceptee to each preceptor, but if we don't have enough preceptors, we will have say two preceptees to each preceptor. What we also do is towards the end of preceptorship, we know that if preceptee has had a good preceptorship, they actually want to give back and become a preceptor themselves. So they will receive perceptor development so it's a nice little rolling program of growing bank of preceptors it's not something we've had an issue with to date so don't worry whoever anonymous attendee is you will get a preceptor I think I'd also like to add to that is some organizations are also looking at um, things like legacy mentors mm. So they're redeploying people at a later stage in the career or may 
who may have retired to return back into organisations to support those new registrants, to build, to support that capacity. So there's lots of creative solutions mm -hmm. around how organisations are bringing uh, in more capacity. And of course, we've got the new clinical nurse, uh, the nurse educator strategy that was recently released. So we know growing that um that workforce doing you know in terms of those who, who support both students and new registrants as well as other people in that organization will is is, is in development so i we it's recognized as a huge area to take forward brilliant i'm sure that provides some great reassurance so thank you and perfect time on the question so that is going to draw us to an end um to the webinar today i'd like to say a huge thank you to jane and desiree for joining us and sharing so much information um please do get in touch with us if you have any follow-up questions i'll share the slides with all the attendees um, and that has the contact details for jane and desiree or you can also um, email me or the events team so thank you very much goodbye thank you